and you can see so clearly that Jesus, the King of the universe, loves you with an immeasurable love, but not only that, he has great purpose for your life. Tonight, we all have a story, and it's the same story. Seven words, I was blind, but now I see. And Jesus, he's the hero of our stories. It is all about him, because Jesus is the only one who can make the things that once seemed absolutely impossible, possible. Jesus is the only one who can take us from bondage to freedom, from blindness to sight, from death to life. And that transformation, that story, is what we are here to celebrate tonight. Holy Spirit, you see the hands right now. Would you fill us right now as you do? Would you invade our hearts and our minds? Would you equip us for your service? Would you challenge us to, to step forward in bold obedience? Would you empower us to do the things we think are often impossible? Would you comfort us? Would you grant us peace? Would you give us words to say whenever we feel like we're not sure what to do? Fill our lives right now in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Beaver Valley Lighthouse is where I volunteer. It's in New Brighton. I call it a social club for the blind and visually impaired. They just get to socialize and get lunch, coffee and donuts in the morning, they play games. I was getting ready for church and something in my head said, wouldn't that be cool to do Revealed at the lighthouse? Some of them can't see at all, and some of them they can see, but it's hard to read. So they needed an audio version. They needed to be able to hear it. We had two weeks, and Lisa Walker at Wexford, she was just wonderful. She took two PDF files that had to be reformatted. Each one had to be separated with a single file. So they went from two large files to 50, I think it was 56 small files, so that we could send them out individually so that they could listen, and it would read it to them. Northway just has gone out of their way to help with this group and help us become visually impaired friendly is what I call it. It's not just here we are on Mondays and here we are on Fridays on our small group. We've bonded not only as friends but spiritually too. We pray for each other and we you know, know that we can count on each other when there's something going on. I had no intention when I came up with the idea, I had no intention of leading that Bible study in that small group. I just thought I would bring the idea to the church and they would put, appoint somebody to do it. That's what I did as a job. I was a, a team facilitator, I was a trainer. I had all the, the background to do this. Somebody kept saying it in my head, you can do this, you can do this. And I finally said, okay. And I'm glad I did because it's, it's made such a difference. And not just my life, but uh, this group's lives. I still get nudges, like the nudge to go get that card at the senior lunch for the lighthouse. If I wouldn't have done that and listened to that, we wouldn't be here today. And we wouldn't have done Reveal, we wouldn't be going into Rooted. It's really helped and made me see that there is good out there if you just step out and go and follow that path that, that God's putting you on, even though you're not sure. I don't know how many times I said when we were getting ready for Reveal, how are we ever going to do that? And I've learned now, when we run into obstacles, I don't say, how are we gonna do that? I say, okay, well, let's see how this is gonna work out. And I still have mornings where I'm like, oh, I don't wanna get up and do this. But I get up and go, and 
when I come home, I'm happy. It just brings out a joy in me.
opportunity to celebrate communion together. You may be seated. On your way in, you, you should have received the elements, and, and if you miss them, our ushers are standing by and they're ready to hand those out. If, if that's you, just simply raise your hand so they can be able to, to get to you there and, and hand you those elements. And while they're doing that here at Northway, we practice what is known as an open table when it comes to communion. That simply means that if Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, that that means celebrate this with us because that's what this is all about. And if, as you have those elements, that cup there, if you could just open up that bread side, you can place that in your hands and then you can turn it over and you can prepare the cup. We just sang something that's so powerful about what this, this image is of why we celebrate communion. Jesus is not only the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, and he hung on that cross for you and for me. Why? Because we all have a sin problem. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We can't look around and say, that person's worse than me, and that, nope, nope, nope. We all have that, and God knew that, and he loved us so much. He gave his one and only son, the Lamb of God who hung on that cross. He wasn't just the Lamb on the cross, though. He was the lion, the lion of Judah, the mighty lion that rose again for you and for me because no grave could ever hold his love for you. No tomb could ever hold his power of what he can do in your life. And now, now as we have the opportunity, anybody does to step into a relationship with him. And as we're in that relationship, there's no enemy that could ever hold us down. There's no circumstance. There's no issue because guess what? There's no body in that grave now. We serve a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible says is nearer than the very mention of his name. And he loves you more than you could ever imagine. And let me remind you, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from because we're all sinners saved by grace. Paul tells us that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and after he had given thanks, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive the bread together. He goes on to share that in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink from it in remembrance of me. Let's receive that together. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's just take a moment, church. Let's take a moment to reflect on the awesomeness of God and his love for you and me. Church, could you stand with me? Our worship team's gonna sing a, a song over you. It's a new song. We're gonna be singing this in the next couple weeks and celebrating together during Easter to this, but the heart of this song comes from what I just encouraged you with. So be blessed by this. Allow them to sing this over you, and when you're ready, you can sing along with them.
Lion who rose, who defeated the grave. Anybody know he defeated the grave? I said, anybody know he defeated the grave? That we can search all over. We can look far and wide, but there's no body in the grave now. And because there's no body in the grave now, we get to live life with him. And we get to have another chance, even though we mess up, and even though we don't deserve it. Anybody know that we don't deserve it? I can't speak for you, but I know that Adam doesn't deserve another chance. But there's something about the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ that he went to the cross that he hung there didn't say a mumbling word didn't complain took the beating took the crown of thorns he hung his head and he died for me and for you that's love love that we don't deserve love that we can't purchase but he loves us and so he went through all of that not just for me but for you and the person sitting next to you and the person sitting behind you and the person standing in front of you so father we thank you we thank you Jesus we thank you for the cross we thank you that there is no body in the grave now. We thank you that you rose with all power in your hands. So we lift you up. We magnify you. And today we worship you. You are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Thank God and amen. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. You guys can go. Northway the music ended like real nice and quiet and soft I wanted to come out fast and strong and loud and it just didn't match the the music at all um, so hey I am really excited to be here tonight it's it's been a while since I preached it's actually been a couple months and please hear me for that I am grateful for that because it's been a busy season over the past year or so, right, if you've been around, I, I make fun of my job title here quite a bit at Northway. And in case you don't know what my job title is, I'm the executive pastor of Generosity and Expansion. Come on. Like, that's a, that's a title right there, right? Huh? See, in these last couple months or so have been crazy because if you just heard at your location, we're launching our seventh location. Like we're soft launching in the South Hills in the Peters Township area. We are currently one of my roles is to help us find a new permanent spot. We're looking at a bunch of different options for that. So keep that in prayer. And then also deep and wide, our year end giving initiative. That was um, one of my responsibilities over the last couple months. And I just want to like add my personal thanks. All right. Thank you for giving. Like if you didn't hear 
end of the year, $1.2 million was received. Like, thank you so much for leaning into that. And just so that you know, like, half of that goes right back out the door to, to missions, campus expansion, and the other half stays right here, um, here at, at Wexford, here at whichever location that you're at. So thank you. so. Like, seriously, you're making resources available for our global mission partners. We're going to be able to do stuff for them that we might not have been able to do without that. Um, one of the first things that we did with a small portion of the year-end giving initiative is we have this conference coming up next weekend, a family and marriage conference, and we made it like five bucks. So we just covered all the costs. So you can come, you can invite friends to this. Um, Mark Batterson, he's the lead pastor at National Community Church in DC, um, will be here. And here's what I know, like I get it. Some of you don't know who Mark is. I do. Like I've met Mark on several occasions. He was one of the early innovators in multi-site church. This guy brilliantly thought about launching churches in movie theaters near transit stops all around the D.C. area. And, and just an amazing ministry to that area. One of his books, a book called A Pit in a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day, still is one of my favorite books of all time. If you've never read that, check it out. He wrote another book called Circle Maker. Like, seriously, it changed the way that I pray for my wife, for my kids. For some of you, I've used this book as a way to pray for you. Um, you know, I don't, he, he's going to be here speaking to marriage and, and parenting and, and prayer. And, and the best way that I can sum up his stuff, it's simple, it's practical, and it's solid. Like, I vouch for Mark Batterson. And if you can be here, you really ought to be here and buy some tickets and invite a bunch of folks with you. So yes, like I've been busy with generosity. I've been busy with expansion, but get out, guess, guess what else? Guess who you're looking at right here? I've recently become Northway's interim director of safety and security also. Huh? Like look at that title now. Yeah. Here's what I know. Right now, you feel a little safer and secure than you did just a, a, a few minutes ago. Business cards are being printed up. I can't wait to tell my mom. Like, um, so however, it's like today I did come to preach as we continue in this series around the table. I don't know about you, I've loved this series. We've been looking at these accounts of Jesus in the New Testament where he had meals with folks. And I love the text that I get to preach out of today. It's found in Luke 19. It's the story of the wee little man, Zacchaeus, the, the tax collector. And before I read that text, though, I want to open up with something that was not part of my plan or not part of my, like, prep for this sermon. A few weeks ago, I was just on my own reading through this Old Testament story. Um, and I really, like, I don't want to over-spiritualize this. And if you know me, I don't say things like this often. But as I was reading this, I just, I just knew that, like, God was saying, like, Scott, you got to use this in the sermon this week. And I'm like, it, it doesn't have nothing to do with the sermon, God. And he's like, no, I, I really... There's a few thoughts I really want you to share. And it's this account of the nation of Israel after they left years of slavery in Egypt. That's what I just happened to be reading through. And God promised them the promised land, right? But because they were intimidated by what they saw in that promised land, they, for 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness, settling sort of in the hill country instead. So stay with me here. I'm going to unpack this a bit as we go through this sermon today. But this is the word like that sort of God gave me, and I think it's for some of you here today. Um, sometimes we, we have wandered or settled for so long that we think that's where we're supposed to be. See, the wilderness was not meant for the people at this time to live in. It was actually meant for them to pass through on their way to the promised land. A couple questions. Have you settled somewhere right now where you were only meant to pass through? You weren't supposed to stay there. And secondly, are you maybe like knowingly or even unknowingly wandering in a wilderness mindset right now? Maybe you're settling for like a hill country pattern in your life. See, I believe there are moments in your life that God desperately wants to call you out of these patterns and mindsets and, and lifestyles that you're only supposed to pass through. You weren't supposed to stay there. 
That's what I want to talk to us about today. I'm going to unpack that as we look at this story of Zacchaeus. So in, in, in Luke 19, we find this account. I'm just going to read this straight through for us. It says, he entered Jericho, that's Jesus. He was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector. He was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature, it said. So he ran out ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. That's Jesus. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and he received Jesus joyfully. And when they saw it, so that's like the crowds, they all grumbled. Like, look, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus, he stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek, the sa- to seek and to save the lost. Verse 1 there, it said Jesus was passing through. Did you pick up on that? He was passing through Jericho. He was headed somewhere else. You know where he was headed? The very end of this chapter, we get the story of Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem. And by the end of that week, he was going to be on a cross. Jesus was passing through Jerusalem, I mean through Jericho, but he was headed to Jerusalem. He was headed to the cross. He, he, he knew what was coming up very shortly in his life. And, and there's two things. One, one, two things I just want to point out. One, I'm just going to sort of say it again. I'll put it up here. Are you knowingly or unknowingly wandering and or settled in a place that you were only meant to pass through? And secondly, Jesus is coming down the last stretch of his life on earth. But get this, he's not mailing it in. He knows the end is near And he's pouring everything he's got into every last encounter that he's going to have here on earth. And can I pause for a second and just speak to any like fellow older Christian followers here with, so I'm one, like a fellow older follower. Can I challenge you with something? Don't mail in this season of your life, right? You know, a boxer that, that has a big punch, in his or her prime, often what happens is they get older, they might lose their speed. They, they might lose their legs, right? They might not have the strength they once had. They might lose like their ability to take a punch. But as older boxers get older, they still have a powerful punch. It's the last thing they lose. Older generation, you still have power. Like you got quite a few rounds left. Don't stop looking for that next encounter and an encounter that can impact a life for Christ. See, as Jesus entered Jericho, this massive crowd comes out to see him. And they've probably heard about his radical kingdom teaching. They've heard about the ways he's challenged the Pharisees. And certainly they know about all these miracles that he's done. And before Jesus encounters Zacchaeus under that tree, the gospel writer of this gospel, Luke, he tells us three things about Zacchaeus. One, that he was the chief tax collector in Jericho. And we've addressed this in this series. So I'm not going to go into this in any detail. But as a tax collector, Zacchaeus was despised. He was a traitor to his fellow Jews. He worked for the ruling Roman government to collect taxes brutally and oppressively. And then he also had the authority to squeeze out extra income for himself. He was hated. Secondly, Zacchaeus was extremely wealthy. It said he was rich, right? Jericho. It was along a, a major trade route at this town, at this time. So Zacchaeus, what he would do, he would set, set up these tax booths as people would enter town with their goods and he'd tax them on what they were bringing in to sell and then he'd catch them on the way out and he'd tax them again on what they bought. And at this time, like get this, there were tax collectors almost in every single town. 
But there were only three major franchises like this one in Jericho that were along these trade routes. There was this one, there was one in Caesarea, and there was one in Capernaum. Chief tax collectors, if they had those franchises at this time, they were among the wealthiest people in the entire region. And just by the way, do you know who the chief tax collector was that had the franchise in Capernaum? Matthew, who Jesus saw sitting in his tax booth and said, follow me. Matthew dropped everything and and followed Jesus. Zacchaeus was hated. He was wealthy. And then three, it was recorded, he was small of stature. That's a very politically correct way to say, like, dude is a little dude. He was a wee little man, right? Like that. I remember a Sunday school song when I was a little kid, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree, see what he could see. I inquired to see if the bands could slip that into the worship set this week, but they declined. They said no. Um, in my sermon prep time, though, get this. I came across this archaeological study that discovered human rain, remains from this region during this time. Tracking with me? One of their findings actually determined what the average height of a Semitic man would be in that region in the first century. What do you think the average height of a man was in this region at this time? Five foot one to five foot five. I would have been like a superstar in the MEBA, right? Middle East Basketball Association. I'd be swatting people, little five foot one dudes coming up. Five foot one, five foot five was the average. Then how little was Zacchaeus that they actually put in the Bible that he was small of stature, right? He had to be a little, little guy. I don't know. My only picture is like Danny DeVito in a a tunic sitting up in that tree, right? That's, That's how little that dude must have been. So there's a couple obvious reasons why Zacchaeus was in that tree that day. One, right, he, he, wanted, he was short. He wanted to be able to see over the crowd so he could see Jesus. Got out ahead of that parade, climbed up a tree so he could see Jesus. Two, I think it was safe for him. He was hated. It wasn't going to be a good thing for this dude to be walking around in the crowd. My, my guess is he'd have caught like an, well, probably like an elbow or, or two, right? <laughs> but, but I wonder if there's not another reason that he was in that tree. Not just so that he could see Jesus, but also maybe so that Jesus could see him. Maybe years of cheating and stealing and selfishness and greed and loneliness and fear, maybe he felt like it was possibly a time for a change. Maybe he realized that he'd been wandering in the wilderness and settled for a lifestyle way too long. Maybe God was nudging him to stop wandering and settling and go climb a tree. Let me just ask you a question. What's, what's stopping you right now from seeing and, and, and being seen by Jesus today? Where are you wandering through life in the wilderness? Where have you settled? Maybe you said something like, well, well someday, God, but not today. Someday, God, like I'm, I'm going to give that up, but not today. Someday, God, I'm, I'm going to truly... I'm going to really try to figure you out. I'm going to really, truly follow you, but not today. <clears throat> Someday, God, I'm going to begin to be generous and, and give, but not today. Someday, God, I'm going to work on my marriage, but not today. Someday, God, I'm going to put an end to this destructive behavior in my life, but not today. Do you have a someday attitude when it comes to Jesus? And let me just ask you, is it time to change? Perhaps you were just meant to pass through where it is that you've been wandering around and settling in for quite a while. Maybe it's time for you to go climb a tree. Here's a couple things I know, that if you position yourself to be seen by Jesus, he will see you. Like it says, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, he saw him, come on down. I'm gonna stay at your house today. Jesus saw him, he will see you too. You know, this is the only time in the Bible that it's recorded that Jesus invites himself to someone's house. Only spot. To American ears, I don't know, does that sound like sort of forward or even rude? Like Jesus, like, man, you just invited yourself over to this dude's house out of nowhere, right? Get this, to, to, to Middle Eastern cultures, that was and still is super common. It would have been encouraged. 
If someone were to say to me today, maybe you, hey, hey, like somebody walks up to, hey, we should get dinner sometime. You know what I would do? I'd probably pull out my phone and I'd look like three or four weeks out from now to see when I might be available. See, see, in this culture, if someone said they were having, wanted to have dinner with you, you better go home and fire up your grill because they're coming over that day. What if that was an American in the sycamore tree? He'd probably say, wait, like my house is a mess. And, and, and oh, we don't have any food. I don't have any food ready for this. And it's Wednesday and like I watch Survivor. Like, right? We, we wouldn't have done this. If someone were to invite you to grab lunch tomorrow, let's say, on the spot. Hey, let's go grab lunch right now. Someone, let, let me push this a little further. Someone that maybe, I don't know, grew up in a different culture than you, has a different belief system than you, has a different lifestyle than you. Would you go? Let me make that a little more personal. What if they invited you to their house for dinner that night? Would you go? Let me ask you a little different direction now, all right? What if you're talking to somebody this week and for whatever reason, God is nudging you like, I need to invite this guy to lunch right now. Would you do it? Let me make it a little more personal. What if God is nudging you to invite someone to your house for dinner today? Would you do it? Maybe it's a person at work that's new. Maybe it's somebody new to your neighborhood. Maybe it's somebody that you know just went through an incredible tragedy or crisis in their life. What if it's that socially awkward person though? but you know is like extremely lonely. So here's your homework for today. Go home and whatever you're making for dinner, double it and freeze half. There, I just solved your problem. Now you got food. You got food at your house. And frankly, nobody cares your house is a mess. If you feel like you're supposed to invite them, just invite them. When Jesus called out to Zacchaeus, it, it, it says that he hurried down and received him joyfully. So, so let me just push this up like another level. If you know it's time for a change, you've been wandering, you've settled, and you're willing to position yourself to, to, to be seen by Jesus, are you willing for Jesus to interrupt your schedule? Zacchaeus did. And oh, by the way, if, if God wants to do something in you, he doesn't have to check your schedule. He's just going to do it. See, see, we all must stay in place, in this place, where we're ready to breathe in the presence of God and to be interrupted by what he wants to do in us. If Jesus were to say to you, hey, come on down from that tree before you hurt yourself, would you climb down and receive him joyfully in that, in that moment? See, the interruption may be him preparing you for something he has scheduled for you. He did not promise you a schedule. He promised you his spirit and his spirit will tell you when to sit still and wait and when to get up and move. You know, after Jesus died on that cross and, and rose from dead and then returned to the father, it says the disciples waited on his spirit. And when it came, they received it and then they got up and they moved in the spirit. We must realize that some of the best things that God is going to do in our lives will not be on our schedule. When you allow God to reset your schedule, what you think might be an in interruption, it might actually be an invitation for a breakthrough in your life. You know, I remember 15 or, or 20 years ago, I just had this constant like sort of as the lead pastor here and I was thinking I should I need to get out onto the mission field and visit some of our global mission partners that, that haven't had somebody from Northway visit them in a long time, places like India and China. But I was like, uh-uh, maybe someday, God, but not today. Like, Scotty, don't travel. I'm not doing India. Mm -mm. God, I'm not going to China. That sounds crazy. And it just persisted. And finally, I said, okay. And I got to tell you, those trips were dramatic interruptions in my life and in my schedule. But do you know what happened? I saw a blind man healed. I snuck across a border into a country and baptized like a, a government official. I met people whose faith look, made mine look silly. M my faith took a change and that it's never happened like that since in that time. Like it just exploded. 
I, I got clearer direction and vision in life. I, I got a perspective of God's global work and what he's doing in the world because I decided in that moment to climb a tree and say, okay, God, today, not, not someday. Zacchaeus, what he did was he allowed his schedule to be interrupted to have dinner with Jesus. And I'm not sure what they talked about around that table. And I'm not even sure. It doesn't really say who's there for that dinner conversation. But at some point, it's recorded, and it says this. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. Do you think that's a short joke right there? Do you, do you, think, do you think, like, Zacchaeus stood up and Jesus is like, Stand up, Zacchaeus. And he's like, I am standing. I think Jesus has a sense of humor. I think that's what's going on. And, Jesus, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it full forward. He gave half of everything he had. I told you this guy was rich to so the poor, right on the spot. And as you're... As your executive pastor of generosity, I don't know how much that was, but I'd say it's lots. Like lots and lots is, is what he just gave right there. And Zacchaeus doesn't stop there. You know, back in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, it speaks to if you've defrauded somebody, if you rip somebody off, the Mosaic law back then said this, that, that they must make full restitution of the wrong they have done, and they have to add a fifth of the value to it and give it to the person that they've wronged, right? So if you wrong somebody out of 100 bucks, Mosaic law says, I got to give him back 120. Zacchaeus says, if I've ripped somebody off, I'm going to give it back fourfold. He said, if I've taken advantage of somebody for 100 bucks, I'm going to give them $400. What happened at that dinner? that resulted in Zacchaeus' is like this just gigantic fourfold turnaround. See, see, I believe we get a glimpse of the conversation that day at dinner um, with Jesus' final words in this encounter. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he is also the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. What happened at that, that dinner? Salvation came to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus had lost his way and Jesus did what Jesus came to do, to seek and to save the lost. You know, the, the nation of Israel, it chose to wander and settle for 40 years in the wilderness because they were intimidated by what they saw in the promised land. Around the year 39 of them wandering in the wilderness, a word came to them from the Lord. And it said this, Then the Lord said, You have been traveling around this hill country long enough. Now turn north. God spoke to them as they wandered and they settled, and he said, That's enough. It's time to turn north. Not someday. Today. That's a word for somebody here today. Some of you have been wandering in the wilderness and settling in the whole country. And I'm just here to tell you, it's long enough. Turn north. Do you happen to recall what the first battle was? that the nation of Israel had to fight as they headed north to the promised land? Do you remember what the first battle was? The battle of Jericho. The same town Jesus passed through on his way to Jerusalem and the cross. The same Jesus that still seeks to save the lost. Now, I'm not sure where you've been wandering and where you've settled but I am sure it's time to stop. It's time to stop saying someday, and it's just time to let today be the day and turn north. I, I have no idea, like, at any point in this time that I've been talking to you, I, I have no idea if at some point when I, when I started talking about 
you, you know you've been wandering and settling. Did something come to mind? Like you know there's something that you're supposed to be doing with your life and you've just settled or you're just wandering aimlessly. Or like I said, maybe you don't even know it and maybe it's just something that's happening. Right? What amazing thing about our God is he can speak to every single person in this room with something different all at the same time. So the person sitting next to you might've heard something completely different from God than you. But my guess is somewhere in this, there's something that you need to stop wandering. You need to stop settling for less. Maybe it's something to do with a relationship in your life. And maybe it's just time like, dude, it's time to get married. Stop playing house. Let's go. Maybe for you, it's a relationship with someone that you've struggled with for a long time. You haven't talked to. Come on. It's time to reconcile. Maybe it's something at work. Maybe it's some destructive behavior that you're doing. That you've been keeping quiet. Maybe it's somebody that you need to go make an apology to. But how long are you going to wander and settle. And here's my challenge to you. Like if something came up and you're like, all right, Stevens, you're talking to me. It's not me talking to you. It's God talking to you. And it's not someday. Do it today. Get after it today. Head north today. And then there's another group of you that, that I know in this room that you, when it comes to committing to Jesus, when it comes to really becoming and being a follower of Christ and saying, I'm with him. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what my friends say. I need to start really following Jesus. There's some of you, like you keep saying someday. Now let it be today. Today's the day. Stop it. Stop wandering. Stop settling for a life that, that you aren't meant to live. Follow Christ. He, he will change. I always say it's the absolute best thing that I've ever done in my life is the day that I decided to follow Jesus Christ. Not been easy, but it's been best. If you just bow your heads, let me just wrap us up in prayer. Right now, if there's somebody in this room that like today's your day, like it's enough, then it's just a simple prayer. Like I think, oh gosh, we so overcomplicate it sometimes. It's just a simple prayer. So if today's the day, that you really want to put your life in the hands of Jesus. Just use, your, use these words, use your own words. Just say something like, God, today, not someday, today. Today, I, I want to thank you for, for going to that cross for me. I want to thank you for forgiving me of my sins and writing my relationship with God the Father. And God, today, I, I want to follow you. I'm not even sure what that looks like, but today, I want to follow you. And just with all heads bowed, just no one looking around, just, just know that. If you said that prayer, just be assured. He knows it. He sees it. You're now a Christ follower. Head north. We love you, Lord, in your son's name. Amen.